That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today, we're here to uh, have a commemorative conversation, I believe. Commemorative. Answer questions. Uh, the purpose of this video. We made a video when we hit 1,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. And people seem to like that. I didn't imagine people would want to know more about us. Okay. So, seems like, based on the questions we received, people are curious. Yay! So, to commemorate 5,000 subscribers, mm -hmm. here we are. Um, what do you want to say about your YouTube journey? <laughs> I really... Well, here. We had already talked about this. Yes. So, <laughs> I'll just get the party going. Um... No, just how cool it is that there seem to be like-minded people out in the, um... Out in these streets. Out in these streets mm -hmm. who enjoy our, like, sense of humor and weirdness. Mm -hmm. and so that's been really, uh, affirming and positive. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also interesting because I feel like there are people who, you know, we're both very busy outside of doing these videos, so... Um, responding to comments is not always possible, but we do see most of them. Mm -hmm. And we do recognize certain people who comment often. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool, but it's interesting because oftentimes people don't have like a profile or socials attached. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, we would be friends because mm -hmm. we seem to have similar tastes and sense of humor. Um, or at the bare minimum to be fr my friend, you just have to really like me. But, uh, you know, but then it's like, I don't know you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting. I wish that there were a way to get to know people a little better. Because I think we both would be very open to, like, meeting people. I mean, not right now with the world ending, but I, st I still think it would be really cool. And, and I think it's really nice that there seem to be so many just nice people out there. Yeah, let's see what the post-apocalypse brings. Yeah, right. Um, so before we answer um, some of the questions we received, I wanted to talk about two videos we posted that um, got more views than normal because I think they represent two really weird um, spaces within like social media. Sure. So the first one is uh, the video for the Allen versus Pharaoh documentary. The four part series, yeah. The four part series that was on HBO. Mm -hmm. um, so many comments about people. So what I find so interesting about that video and the comments we received is this idea of like the court of public opinion and people having these very, very strong opinions about who did what. And, and it's just like, we don't know. And, the, and I think, you know, I'm assuming a lot of times the comments that we see are just people trolling, like they're copying and pasting, like they didn't even watch the video. But it's kind of sad to me that People have put so much energy into wanting to vilify people whose situations they don't know. Honestly, to me, I feel like that documentary was meant more for, like, entertainment than anything. Because we don't know. Like, that's what we have a judicial system for. Mm -hmm. And it failed someone, right? Either failed Woody Allen or Mia Farrow. So, you know, we're just witnessing that experience. Right. And from what I remember, I, I had had my second... Um... COVID shot. COVID shot the, shot the day before we recorded that. So I was very feverish uh -huh. that whole day. Uh, little did I know that that would be one of the most viewed. Uh, but And I had that terrible mustache. <clears throat> no, never terrible. Uh, and from what I remember of that is we tried to be kind of just very fair. And I remember saying that, you know, just what this presents is it muddies the waters. It's just, it's not clear and I don't, it's uncomfortable to view that. Yeah. The other video is the review for the documentary, The Most Beautiful Boy in the World. Okay, this one is so fascinating to me because I'm pretty sure of all the people who watched and commented, maybe, all, like, no one has seen it. This video, the the review, the movie, the documentary only showed at Sundance. It unless you for paid, two showings. Unless you were pressed at Sundance or paid to see it at Sundance, you didn't see that film yet. Yeah. And people were so nasty about what we. I had to delete so many comments, but because there's people were very upset that I hadn't seen Death in Venice, even though the documentary is not about Death in Venice. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also they have very strong opinions about a documentary they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. So I think that occupies another very interesting space with social media and YouTube and people just wanting to be mad. 
Like, I know for me, I'm just talking out of the side of my ass half the time. Like, not... I mean, you know, I, I, I have an awareness that I'm trying to be amusing, but... Also, I'm giving my honest opinion. I think that's the, the you know, it's, it, what is Bob, the, who's Bob the drag queen quoting all the time when he's shouting, it's my opinion. Yeah, uh, whoever he's quoting, it's my opinion. Yeah. But also it's like, if we, like, it would be like if friends of ours, we were all sitting mm -hmm. and we watched the documentary and then once it was done, us having a conversation. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I feel about it. So, yeah, those two have been really interesting. Like, to say the least, yeah. Yeah, to. Because who would have thought? Who would have thought anybody would care about the most beautiful boy in the world. Like, yeah. In fact, I had to, like many film festival uh, offerings, I had to, felt like I had to trick you into watching it, so. Yeah. We also thought um, to get a good sense of our personalities, we would make iTunes playlists. Mm -hmm. So I will post the links in the description of this video um, to get a sense of the kind of music we like. Also, it'll, it'll be fun uh, to witness that Nick's list is four times longer than mine, so not surprising to people who are familiar with Nick. <laughs> uh, I've, I'm often told I'm intense. And... Loquacious. Um, <laughs> all right. And so Yeah, but I like all kinds of things. You can't contain it in just one little list, like, if it speak to... Mood okay, I asked you tones. to make a playlist that represents some of your taste, and you came up with a playlist with over 400 songs. Well, now I've, I've, since you asked me to do that, I've used that playlist for my daily runs. So. Okay, well, I'm, I'm you know, glad it has multi-purpose uh, appeal. Mm -hmm. So, the first question, who replies to the comments? I do. <laughs> I do. It's also important to know that... I see them all. You see them uh, because you'll look at the video comments. Mm -hmm. Um, I almost exclusively only use, so for uploading the video, I use the, um, YouTube studio, like on a browser on my laptop, but looking at like comments and views, I use the app, the YouTube studio app, and it only shows like the three most recent comments. Okay. So I try really hard to not miss comments. Um, I'm sure I do sometimes, but, um, for the most part, yeah you see everything, but I almost exclusively repop, reply to comments. Who designed the intro to your videos? I did. I don't know if this question is shade, like they don't like the intro. <laughs> I'm sure that they do. But yes, you don't care for the graphics that we have. No, I hate the He graphics. hates them. But they make us look old. Like, but that's even why, better. And my eye color is not even... But that's even better because you should like under promise and over deliver. <laughs> so I think we look better than, well, you for sure look better than your cartoon. I don't know about me. Same, but, but you, you, come on now. Uh, I, I think there's just a better, more fun life. Well, if there are any graphic designers out there who want to help us make <clears throat> new um, graphics or an intro video, I am very open to that. I did insist on approving the music you selected though. For the current. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You did. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. Um, all right. How do you decide which movies to review? <clears throat> do you each get a pick or is it more an agreement? Uh, yeah, how do we decide? Okay, so I think what Joseph has learned uh, about this whole process, of because we've been together, well, we can get into that, but I've been a film critic uh, since 2011, like weekly writing and festival coverage. So I think this is... The past two years, he's really discovered that there are uh, a number of weekly releases that you have to keep up with on top of everything else if you want to stay, uh, you know, uh, on it. And that is uh, stressful sometimes. So how we decide is, because whatever you see that we post, I am probably writing or filming uh, something for Ion Cinema as well on top of it. So I have to, on a weekly basis, Tell Joseph, this is what I have screeners for, and what will you agree to watch out of them? And for some things that I feel like, based on the description or poster or trailer, he might not like, but I'll, I'll try to um, sell it in a different way. Like, this is a gay movie, we should watch this, or this is a horror film, you'll like this. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Are there any TV series that you enjoy? We don't watch, like, live TV. No, um, I mean, we don't, mostly timing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just no time. Um, 
And then with all the platforms, because there's because we have Netflix, Hulu, HBO, HBO Max, Amazon Prime. I mean, we have so many things um, at our disposal. And then to think, plus, you know. Plus, we I, both have day jobs. and Well, and, you know, like, we do have access to cable TV. So then I have a few apps on, mm -hmm. like, the Apple TV. Like, I do like Lifetime movies and... But yeah, we really don't watch any live TV. Probably the only thing we keep up with as it's happening is RuPaul's Drag Race. But yeah, yeah. But I, since we don't really watch TV, then maybe the better question for us is, um, like, what's your favorite TV show? Like, from when you were a kid watching TV. Oh, I don't even know. You don't know? I, I'd, I'd have to think about that. I mean, I do currently I do like House of Cards, and that would be something I would watch again. Um, I definitely really, really enjoyed House of Cards. I think my all-time favorite television series would be Absolutely Fabulous. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's probably my all-time favorite. Um, Political Animals with Sigourney Weaver, which is a limited series event. Okay, but that was wasn't necessarily great. She is fantastic. She's very good. And as is Ellen Burstyn. And I would watch it again. Yeah, it's entertaining. But, okay. Come on now. Um, and, uh, what? A, yeah, I don't know. There, there are a, a ton of one-offs. It, it's... I find television very difficult to keep up with. In fact, we wanted to cover uh, the new Lena Waithe series and just didn't get around to it. Um, them, mm -hmm. which came out yesterday. Next, I have really enjoyed watching both of your perspectives on film. What things do you both enjoy doing when not doing <coughs> film reviews? I thought it'd be fun to answer the question for each other. So why don't you say what I like to do outside of these videos? Joseph likes to... Um, well, he likes... Here we go. He likes sweets. Uh, so if we're, if we're ha not necessarily watching what we eat, uh, there will usually be um, a treasure hunt of, for sweets on a daily basis. Uh, he likes to get lost in uh, the, like Instagram and YouTube K-holes. Like he'll just go off and... He likes naps. Uh, he likes to... He, Joseph likes all kinds of things. He's a very uh, multifaceted personality. But... Uh, on his time and his schedule, uh, it has to be his idea, it has to be right, there has to be time for preparation. Um, uh, food, of course, um, I think concerts, again, he, cars, Joseph's very much into cars, uh, it's very, as much as I'm into film, like it, his knowledge about um, vehicles is um, pretty impressive. Uh, I don't know, likes McDonald's a lot, probably too much. Well, for what they all have to offer. I, I think I'm continually surprised, like, oh, McDonald's. That's I've place. also found interest in the Atlantis cruises. Yes, Joseph likes to go on those. Um, probably more than I do, but... <laughs> um, for you, I would say Nick enjoys running. Yeah, I run every day. Wine. Mm -hmm. Red wine. A red wine. Uh, travel. Yes. Nick drinks a lot of coffee. Mm-hmm. Lots to do. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, you enjoy reading. Yes. Like, you read every day, I think. Mm -hmm. And writing. And writing. I write enjoy writing day. a lot, yes. <laughs> um, foxes on Instagram. Nick likes weird little <laughs> creatures, so he'll get, like, all of a sudden he's really into lemurs and sending <laughs> videos about lemurs. Right now, he's really into foxes. Not right now, like, I always have liked Sure, them. sure. But, like, They're you'll so send, cute. yeah, you like foxes, you like those big cats. Uh, what are they, they look like? Car caracals? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Or yeah. lynxes, or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... We, we'd be friends. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't eat me. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't eat you, okay. Uh, baking, I like to bake. So, yes, you do enjoy baking. So, I, I, Nick uh, would consider himself a good baker, but I think in general, Nick likes to prepare food or treats, but what I think you enjoy more is the feedback you get from those things. So, you, he wants to be told, like, he did a good job. Like, Don't you gaslight me. It's a 1950s housewife. <laughs> My cake is fucking good. Not too many F-bombs. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, <laughs> next... <laughs> What were y'all doing in Missouri slash wherever before you moved to L.A.? And is Joseph's tattoo on his ring finger, Nick, and just all the tea on y'all's relationship? Someone trying not to sound like a stalker who could watch a three-hour documentary on YouTube gay homosexuals thriving. Uh, so Missouri should be Minnesota. Yeah, Missouri's not a state I 
think I'd be comfortable in places, but <laughs> I've been to St. Louis a couple times actually. We drove through a small town there once, and, and we drove through once. Um, Nick is born and raised in uh, like northern rural Minnesota. Yeah, mm -hmm. I moved to Minnesota in two thousand four. Over an entanglement. An entanglement. I was in a relationship, a long distance relationship, with someone who lived in Minnesota and decided to transition from where I was living in Las Vegas transition to Minnesota. Uh -huh. And um, I met Nick in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But we'd seen each other around probably... Is this the question where we're just going to oh, ask about... No, there's a, another question. Oh, okay. So, pause. so we'll answer all the tea about our relationship. I mean, I don't know if we can tell all the tea, but... <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. Oh, my ring finger. Yes, that's Nick's name on my ring finger because I lost several wedding rings mm -hmm. in conjunction with just really not liking uh, the feeling of wearing a ring. So I would constantly play with it, take it off, which is how I lost them. Um, so then I just decided to get the tattoo so I wouldn't have to wear the ring. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, a gesture that you appreciate? Yes, of course. Okay. I mean, meanwhile, I have the same ring that I have. Nick has, yeah, has had the same ring for 12 years and uh, has never... I, I've only seen you take it off. I don't know that I've ever seen you take it off. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, Fair. I would take mine off all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, next. Holy wow, I can't wait to see y'all hit the 5k sub milestone. I'm like an early subscriber, somewhere around the 500 to 600 count. So when I saw the post last night, I'm like, oh boys, I have so many, lol. So here I am, 24 hours later, after narrowing down all my curiosities. The number one burning question eating away at my soul every time I consume a fish jelly film review is, when, where, how did the Nick and Joseph love story begin? Or better yet, when did it culminate? So, um... Can I drink? Sure. So, so a friend introduced us at a bar in Minneapolis called The Saloon. Mm -hmm. And there are some details I don't quite remember, but I, I know that you invited me to a movie night mm -hmm. the following night. So I think I met you on a Friday night and your movie night was on Saturday. I think we met on Saturday and it was Sunday, but it's fine. Okay. So met him... At the bar, he invited me to his movie night. I went the next day, and you were showing Psycho. Mm -hmm. The Hitchcock classic, yeah. And so I stayed for that. Then some of his friends stayed, and then we all walked, because his apartment was very close to like downtown Minneapolis, so we could walk to the bars. So we walked back to the saloon, mm -hmm. and we hit it off. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked you out on a date. You asked me out on a date. Um, Remember where that was? It was someplace oh off of Washington. <laughs> Spill the wine. Spill the wine. So you tried to take me to like a fancy dinner. I tried, yeah. You tried, <laughs> uh, which was lovely. I think your impression to me when we first met was that I was more fancy than I am. Yeah, you had, you had a thing at the time for those like sweater overthrow. What Cardigans. Are Cardigans, yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we hit it off. The important thing to know about that is... For the for an entire year before we were introduced, I would see Nick around, like at house parties, at a, a local bar near my apartment at the time. And he really wouldn't pay attention to me, which kind of bothered me because in my mind, I'm like, he should want my attention. But he, he, he didn't seem interested in me at all. Come to find out he wasn't single, and that's why he was not really like showing any interest. But yeah, after we... Hung out a, a couple times. Things escalated very quickly. Mm -hmm. And we've been married for almost... We've been together for almost we've been, 13. We've been married together for, for 13 years and married for over 10. Yeah, it'll be 11. 11 years. We eloped. Well, because <laughs> same-sex marriage was not legal in Minnesota at the time, so we had to go to Massachusetts, um, which well, is unfortunate. It was that or Iowa. It was that or Iowa. Sorry, Iowa. We felt more comfortable going to the place that had been doing it the longest. The mm -hmm. experience was very nice. The judge was very um, kind. Mm -hmm. uh, we, t we had a photographer take photos of us. It was bittersweet because we couldn't really invite, you know, organizing like family and friends at that time, you know, for like a destination thing just seemed complicated. So we just mm -hmm. went and spent the weekend and did it. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, we've been through a lot, uh -huh. <laughs> but we're still together. <laughs> um, you seem happy. Yeah. Yes. You do sometimes. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. certainly could do worse. <sighs> but no, I'm just That's kidding. the spirit. <laughs> I mean, it's work, but uh, it, 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 not every day can be rainbow and sunshine. No, it cannot. So. Next. Can you explain why Justin Timberlake is banned from your house? What made you fall in love with Janet Jackson and Sigourney Weaver? How did your love of cinema begin? Would you guys ever consider doing a vlog talking about world events? Okay, so four parts. Okay. Uh, so, it, this, so the Justin Timberlake thing revolves around Nipplegate, mm -hmm. so the Super Bowl incident with Janet Jackson. So, obviously Janet Jackson is my fave, but beyond that, what really bothers me about the Justin Timberlake situation is what it represented. So, like, a man... A white, a white man. Essentially, like, assaulted a woman. Uh -huh. Like, symbolically. I know that it was planned, no matter what these people say, I know they plan to do this. But what it represented, like, he assaulted this woman, exposed her breast, and the way society interpreted that was, like, blame the woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not Justin Timberlake's fault, because that's just how trash society is. But um, the fact that he didn't come out and say, hey, like, why are we, like, we shouldn't be blaming her. Like, I'm the one who pulled yeah. her damn titty out, and he didn't. And after all these years, I mean, he's been banned since then, but especially recently with that stupid message he sent about how he apologizes to Janet and Brittany, just felt so lame. And then his producer or his manager, Johnny Wright, posting that thing about how Janet should forgive him. I just think, like, he needs to do a little bit more. Yeah. Because it's really about misogyny. It's about, like... It, it's so much more than just, like, my fave getting canceled for a period of time. It's just, like, he didn't do what I think he should have done to... Um, alleviate. Alleviate the, and de-escalate. Yes. What made you fall in love with Sigourney Weaver? Uh, did you answer what made you fall in love with Janet? Oh, you want me to do that? Uh, first? Okay. Sure. Uh, 1987. Mm -hmm. I'm inside of a Target store in Moreno Valley, California. I was uh, nine years old. Mm -hmm. And my mom and I are walking through the music section. And at the time, that was uh, cassettes and albums. So I'm walking by. And, you know, cassettes used to come in a tall cartridge. Mm -hmm. And I walk yeah. past and I see the artwork for the Control album, which is red with a woman dressed in black with sort of a triangular shape and a blue, like, geometric shape. I had no idea what it was. I had never owned a cassette. Didn't, certainly didn't know who Janet Jackson was. And asked my mom to buy it. She didn't buy it on that trip, but on a subsequent trip, she bought it. And I held on to that, like the cartridge, the artwork. As like I had it in my bedroom, like as artwork, for a year until I finally got a boombox. And when I played that cassette, I just, I, I, I just was hooked. And lucky for me, the, because I often say a lot of young people, we all fixate. Like I often think about my sister, who really, really wore the hell out of a four non-blondes cassette single. Oh, God. <laughs> and it's like, you know, had that band persisted and, like, had more hits, she probably would still be a fan. But, mm -hmm. you know, or she liked New Kids on the Block. She liked a lot of, like, sort of one-off things. But I fixated on someone who continued to, you know, be Long, very successful. Longevity. Very long career. And so, you know, I, I think the fact that she has had longevity has just made me really love her even more. Mm -hmm. What about Sigourney? Same with mine. Well, this was uh, picture 1994. Sicily. Nice. <laughs> Sicily. Uh, Northern Minnesota. Uh, I think the sci-fi channel was on and my, my mother and I were watching it and some... I, I'd seen the alien films at the local video store, which I, of course, was in as often as possible then. Um, and I... The, the, if you were familiar with the original covers of the alien, the first three at this point in time, um, it doesn't tell you much. Like, I don't think that Sigourney Weaver was even featured as an actor on them. But um, we're watching this special about the making of the trilogy at the time, and Tom Skerritt is hosting it. And my mom's watching it and very interested, says she likes the Alien movies. And I remember the first time hearing the name Sigourney, and I'm like, God, that's interesting and strange and lovely. And, um, and that, that program was just about... I didn't even see what she looked like then, ostensibly in that. So I was like, oh, can we rent that next time we go? We rent it. 
it's me and my dad then watching Alien for the first time, and immediately I was like, which one's Sigourney Weaver? And he points, he points her out, and I'm like, okay, I like her. And then of course, uh, after the first one, I was, I was like, we have to rent the next one the next day. And then after Aliens, after that one weekend, I was hooked on Sigourney Weaver. Um, so, and then it began, it just, in 1994, about that time, she was doing a bunch of films, like Death and the Maiden and Copycat and things that I had to sneak watch after they came out on VHS, which, you know, was a year behind, but. How did your love of cinema begin? So I would say Nick has a true love and passion for cinema that I couldn't match. So I don't know that I can really answer that question, except to say that I think, I can say that the film that made me look at, because growing up, like, we didn't watch a lot of movies. It was expensive. Um, and, like, to own movies was expensive. And um, I, so my impression of cinema was just like, oh, whatever is very popular. Maybe I would go see it. Obviously, like, you know, I saw Poetic Justice in the theater. I saw, like, Whitney Houston movies in the theater. But aside from that, that wasn't something we did. Um, but the first film that made me look at cinema as like an art form would be The White Ribbon. And that was 2009? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what about for you? Um, well, obviously my, there was my Sigourney obsession, but my first, before cinema was literature. Like I was a, I was a bookworm, like big time um, nerd in school. Uh, so c cinema, like I had pockets of interest. Like we were a family that really grew up um, my parents liked film, but more obviously American, big budget blockbuster stuff. Uh, but my dad would strangely, both my parents had eclectic tastes of their own, uh, which I got a weird smattering of things in there. Um, but it wasn't uh, until I took a post-secondary class in high school at the community college and I took a film class and it was the first time I'd seen anything with subtitles uh, because my my parents didn't like subtitles, um, and it was La Belle et la Bête, uh, the Jean Cocteau uh, Beauty and the Beast classic, and I think at that time I realized like, oh, there's a whole world of film as an art form that I have uh, been completely ignorant about, and at or about the same time I think was when I saw Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream uh, in 2000, and I think that cemented it, that I knew that I wanted to head into a direction involving worlds like that. Got it. Okay, so what we consider a vlog. Um, so we've been talking about doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm in the car, I rarely listen to music, like almost never. I always listen to podcasts. And then when I'm home, that's when I watch YouTube videos and get on Instagram and TikTok. Mm -hmm. But I think... Um, but the, you told me that you listen to podcasts because you don't want to hear me sing along to music. <laughs> that's true it picture like when Gail and Oprah went on the road trip and how annoyed Oprah was with Gail that's how it is with Nick in the car because if he doesn't like what I'm playing he will make parody lyrics to the song and sing over it so just disrespect it and if he does like the song then he'll just sing along with it which is also like if I want you know I want to hear the artist sing not you um, or he'll just talk over all of it so um, generally when we're in the car together, I usually don't play anything unless I think you'll pay attention to it. So if it's something that you might find interesting, mm -hmm. but anyway, the point is I really like podcasts. So I'm curious to know what people think. So comment below what you would like us to mm -hmm. talk about. My idea was to do a weekly, like maybe one hour talking about cinema related things, but maybe also like a little less focused. I certainly don't want to repeat, um, conversations we had. In YouTube videos so it would have to be and you know there isn't a lot of time to watch even more things so that's why I was thinking maybe like news stories related to actors who have been in the films that's an idea I also I want to avoid maybe like political and foreign affairs because those are often hot button issues that and quite frankly I'm not smart enough to talk about that shit um, Maybe, like, gay news. I don't know. Okay. But, I, like, if people would want that and how that would be structured, uh, like, I'd love to know people's thoughts. Um, what's the next question? Oh. 
What are your astrological signs? What do you think keeps you guys together after such a long time? What would you say to someone who enjoys books over movies? <clears throat> um, we are both Scorpios. Yeah. Although neither of us subscribe to any sort of like um, astrological, astrological fate the or theorems. So, but I do know whenever we say that, people react. Like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, how does that work? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Despite having a big scorpion tattooed on my abdomen, but I was 18. I mean, that was very long ago. Um, yeah, I don't really subscribe to any of that. But, you know, I'm sure that says something about us to some people. Mm -hmm. What keeps us together after such a long time? Respect. What? Okay. Well, love and respect. Okay. And attraction. Okay. And, um... Speak up. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um... Learning to choose your battles and... Um... Forgiving yourself and the other person. Okay. And patient. Alright. And what would you say to someone who enjoys books over movies? L what? You can have both? That would be my thought. Yeah, you can have both. Um, I, I do read a lot. Uh, there was a period, I think undergrad on for a few years I th you know you get so busy in school that you kind of learn enjoying your own things you choose to read um, I've enjoyed getting back into but I'm always reading a book uh, right now I'm reading the story of my wife by Milan Fust uh, which uh, Ildiko and Yeti has made into a film that should come out sometime this year uh, which I really like uh, it, and as you know, I, I buy a lot of books. I have a lot of books. Books were literature was my first love, even before cinema. Um, I, I I don't know. I, I think you can have both, and uh, both are art forms that you can get lost in and learn from endlessly. If you could only watch movies from one director for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? You can take into consideration work that they haven't accomplished yet. So, I feel like you're better equipped to answer this question. If I have to answer it, I'm probably going to get canceled because I think I would say Woody Allen. Because I'm thinking someone who has like a lot of movies for me to choose from. And I do know that I enjoy many of his films. So, that would be my choice. Um, I don't think that... Uh, I think that's a good choice, actually. He, I mean, especially his earlier catalog. There are timeless masterpieces. Few and far between arguably, but I mean, Woody Allen is a good, and, and again, that is how I would measure it, as in, if I'm, can, like, for whatever hypothetical reason, everybody else's uh, celluloid was destroyed irreparably, uh, and I could only watch one director, I'd, you know, probably, I'd, I'd use the same measurements, um, Ingmar Bergman, okay. I think, who's, obviously, Allen is a fan of. Who edits the videos, and do you both get final <clears throat> cut approval? I edit the videos. I get no approval. And I don't show him anything. I just do them. But I also, you know, like, I'm... So actually, there isn't much editing. I don't really... I mean, if people notice, our videos aren't choppy. It's just one long-ass take. Yeah. Because I actually really don't like when videos are very, like... I just don't think it's impressive that someone can't talk for five minutes without, like... 30 takes mm -hmm. or 30 cuts mm -hmm. to me that's strange it is, it is yeah so it is very rare that i will like cut a video or cut something out or piece it together the biggest thing i do is just put silly images in or obviously like stills from the from the films uh -huh. or movie posters references that's the biggest thing but 99 percent of all the videos are just one long take mm -hmm. uh what was the next question? Very Spielbergian of you. Oh. There was one more. I'm I'm getting lost. No, the literature. What did we just say? Oh, about the editing. <laughs> As I like stumble through this. I adore your channel because your analyses are so much fun to watch and nutritional too. My question is, why don't you review more classic films? The other day I saw Nick wearing a t-shirt with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Hello. I'd love to hear what Joseph would say about whatever happened to Baby Jane. Nick too, of course. Um, our original intention was to do new releases and new Blu-ray releases. Mm -hmm. From select labels. Like Arrow, Shout, of course, Criterion. Criterion. So, we live in Los Angeles, Nick would go to screenings. Almost every night of the week. Which is too much for me. So I would just go to maybe one or two, and then those would be the two we would film. 
then we would supplement that with maybe one or two Blu-ray releases. Mm -hmm. But since the pandemic, everything's being uh, released digitally, like all the screenings. So now I can watch a lot more. So I think we're just overwhelmed with new releases that it's hard, because we haven't even, I mean, we've only done a handful of like Blu-ray releases in the past few months. Um, that being said, we do get a lot of requests for reviews of classic films. So I, I do think we need to take the time to do that. I think we definitely need to do reviews of like sort of camp classics. So like whatever happened to Baby Jane, Mommy Dearest. Obviously we need to do Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, I, I would still like to return to it as time has been necessary. I actually have a huge stack of uh, criterions that I've received to review <laughs> that are backlog. Um, and, and of course I do really enjoy and love doing that, but it's just, you know, there's not as much um, Mm, a, a desire for that kind of material, even even that I'm, is a factor because traditionally those videos don't get as many views, which doesn't matter to me. But I'll, it doesn't matter. I'll and still also, talk, but uh, and also that was when we had fewer subscribers. So I don't know. Maybe now if if we were doing, you know, more classics, not just like some random arrow video. Although we did just watch um, a scream in the a scream in the. A mean scream in the streets or something? A scream in the streets. Is that what it's called? 1972. That was garbage. <laughs> that was garbage. I feel like a review of that would have been fun, but it was so all over the place I couldn't take notes. Um, okay, next question. First, I absolutely love you both. Nick, what made you decide to become a movie critic? I love all your knowledge. I'm a huge fan of Isabelle Luper too. The first movie I ever saw her in was The Bedroom Window. I thought she was gorgeous. So why did you want to be a film? Curtis Hansen, one of her, until recently, especially one of her few English language roles. Um, well, and, you know, Joel Schumacher once bitchily said, nobody ever starts out wanting to be a film critic. Uh, I think that it, an opportunity presented itself, and prior to that, uh, to being in English, um, I like to write creatively and otherwise. Um, so the, an opportunity came up and I chose to pursue it and then it just kind of grew and grew and grew and then allowed me to have access to materials and, and worlds in, in, in Los Angeles and in other major cities around the world that, you know, I really liked. I, I like a buffet of cinema. I like, I like to be able, there's something about, and also I like to, you know, in my own very small corner, tucked away behind, you know, thousands of others, you know, have put out there something into the universe, something to say. And, you know, I, I like, it's like that message. And to me, like film criticism, the, what I, how I approach being a film critic, like a message in a bottle, like I'll be long dead. And if the world's still around and maybe somebody will discover something I said and be like, oh, this person was saying <clears throat> very authentically what they thought. And it was counter to what everybody else was saying. That's how I fantasize about my role as a film critic. Um, but, uh, I, I think film criticism is, should be taken seriously. It shouldn't be about followers or being popular. Uh, it should be, you know, uh, uh, you're fostering authentically your own perspective about something and you should, people should be allowed to come to that because they agree with your sentiments for the most part, uh, not just to get Twitter followers. But I like to imagine myself as, you know, the, the glory days of film criticism in the 70s when you had like Pauline Kael. I think she, I think Pauline Kael was a bully, but um, Renata Adler, to me, I fantasize about being kind of like in that mold of Renata Adler. Excellent. What was the first movie you watched in the cinema? For me, it was Mad Max. What movies did you watch as a teenager over and over again? For me, it was Danny DeVito and Eddie Murphy movies. Thank you for your time and effort putting these videos together. Mm. So, what was the first movie you watched? <clears throat> I think um, Little Mermaid was the first thing my mother took me to. Or, it's, it's either that or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Um, whatever, the, whatever came up first. And... Uh, but I do the reaction I had to Honey I Shrunk the Kids. It was a while before she took me into to another live action film because I cried all night about that aunt. Oh God! The first film I recall seeing was in a drive-in. 
uh, and it was flash dance. <gasps> And I remember when there were breasts on the big screen and my mom was like, cover your eyes. <laughs> That's my first memory of like cinema. <laughs> Movies I watched over and over as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was probably younger. Than, the two that pop into my head are Howard the Duck and Gremlins. My sister and I would watch those on repeat. But I was younger than a teenager. Mm -hmm. What about you? Uh, Gremlins, I remember my... The, the grandmother I was close to would rent that for me a lot, even though I'd be terrified and Ernest scared stupid for some reason. Um, but as uh, once I discovered the Alien films, it took me a very long time to buy the box set uh, as a teenager uh, before I could, like as a 12, 13 year old. But when I did those, I watched a ton. I wore out the Aliens tape. I had to take it to the video rental store to have them repair my VHS tape to put like a, st a stint in it or whatever they did. And uh, for whatever reason, I had a, a chunk of a few months where I was watching The Devil's Advocate once a week and Dead Man Walking. And I, I don't know why, but. Hello, Nick and Joseph. If you were able to make a playlist of movie soundtracks, which ones would you include? Joseph, if you had to give an award for worst hair in a movie, which would you pick to win? Come True, The Doctor with the Bangs, <laughs> The Stylist, The Bride to Be, Music, Kate Hudson's Buzz Cut, A Fall from Grace, The High Top, No Fade on Macad Brooks. The award would definitely go to uh, Macad Brooks in A Fall from Grace. Tyler Perry should know better. Tyler Perry is meticulous with his beard, mustache, and the hair on his head. Like, he must get that thing colored every two days. He gets it lined up daily. I just can't believe. And he obviously is attracted to men, so I don't know why he would let like this mm -hmm. so many of his characters in his films have terrible hair and i i don't know i don't know i don't know what's up with that but an honorable mention not on this list is forrest whitaker and burden <laughs> that's bad <It's... laughs> um and then for movie play or movie soundtracks um the only thing that's coming to my mind is the the theme from the bodyguard i used to play that on repeat sure I also would play the Boys in the Hood soundtrack over and over again. What about you? Um, I really like Philip Glass as a composer. So the Hours soundtrack, okay. I, mean, I have several selections of that on my gym mix actually. But Psycho, Suspiria, the original, uh, Sis the Palma Sisters, Under the Skin, Blade. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty, if you check out my uh, musical list, it's, I'm a, feel like I'm a, on the eclectic side with soundtracks as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there was an additional question I forgot to read from that person. Nick, which Sigourney Weaver movies would you recommend for someone that is unfamiliar with her work but are into thrillers? Lots of love, support, and many more subscribers to you because your channel deserves it. Thrillers. Well, Copycat is definitive, must-see. Uh, that is Sigourney a Weaver movie. thriller. I could have, that could be on repeat for me. That's the one with squirrel covers, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Harry Connick Jr. Um, and Holly Hunter, uh, I, you know, the alien movies are like sci-fi thrillers. But I, I consider Death and the Maiden a psychological thriller, uh, Red Lights from 2012, directed by Rodrigo Cortez, I, I just, where she's a paranormal activity debunker. Um, and if you want to see her young and beautiful and fresh off Alien, 1981's Eyewitness, directed by Peter Yates, with William Hurt and Morgan Freeman and James Woods and Pamela Reed recommended all right great channel i have so many questions feel free to answer any or none are we ever getting the long overdue much wanted best of isabel luper <laughs> video and besides sigourney and isabel what are some other actresses actors you both love no small acts review um nick has prepared a best of isabel luper months ago actually. and honestly i forgot about it uh -huh. so so we will do that yeah it has to be a top 10 though because she's got like a, a filmography of a uh, hundred plus and I didn't want it to be too top heavy on her um, things in the past decade. I want to her compass. And then I don't know what No Small Acts me is. It's the Steve McQueen anthology of films. I reviewed all of them for Ion Cinema. Um, so go there if you want to read Nick's thoughts. But the ones outside of the... Because two or three premiered out of the New York Film Festival and there was just no time. The two that went came out on Amazon Prime after that, I did try to generate his interest. But. 
And then the third part of this question is about actress, uh, actors and actresses we like outside of, or you, that you like outside of Sigourney and Isabel. And I was thinking he was going to name like one or two. And this fool has a list that has like a hundred names. No, not a hundred. Well, maybe it does. I, this is unreasonable. Like you can't just run off a long list of names. I can't. Well, that's not interesting. Like, it, the, see, the problem is oftentimes when you give so many options, I feel like it diminishes the value of sure. these options. But these ladies all deserve But to do be what named. you want to do. You do that anyway. So go ahead. Present your thoughts on this. <laughs> Who are actors and actresses you love outside of Sigourney and well, Isabel? A lot. Like, that I will watch a movie if I see their name in the cast list. There's a lot. Um, I do have um, very... Um, I, I'd say uh, esteemable collections of, besides Sigourney and Isabel, uh, Barbara Stanwyck's films, uh, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, Anna Magnani, uh, Catherine Deneuve, and uh, Marlena Dietrich. Like, they each kind of have their own shelves uh, dedicated to them in the house. Uh huh. But, um, uh, well, see, I didn't know you were going to throw such a hissy fit because then I would have. But there are like a hundred names on here. You're uh -huh. really just going to sit here and read a hundred names off? Go ahead. Go ahead. No. We'll see if it makes the cut. Well... Uh, <laughs> this will be the one video I do uh, edit. <laughs> you can cut it. I mean... <clears throat> Can you share some authors or books you like? Who were some actors you had crushes on while you were younger? Continue success with the channel. Fun vibes. So who are some authors you like? Or books? Um, <clears throat> I'm sure this is also a very long list. It's a list, but not as long. Um, I really like Russian literature a lot. Uh, uh, but authors whose works I collect and have read quite a bit of, uh, Vladimir Nabokov, uh, Dostoevsky, Henry James, Willa Cather, Virginia Woolf, James Baldwin, uh, D. H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, Mikhail Bulgakov, uh, William S. Burroughs, Margaret Atwood, Walter Mosley, H. G. Wells, Franz Kafka, Elfrida Yelenik, Anna Kavan, Tennessee Williams, George Simenon, Maya Angelou, Shirley Jackson, Doris Lessing, Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers, Susan Sontag, uh, Martin Amos, Jean Reese, Aldous Huxley, and Toni Morrison crushes we had when we were younger like celebrity crushes oh i was going to preface this by saying i'm not the type to have crushes on people who wouldn't like be would, interested in me who or... wouldn't be interested in me so like straight guys and also mm -hmm. people i wouldn't have access to mm -hmm. so i so i'm more prone to like be interested in someone who i could actually meet sure that being said who are some people who you thought were appealing when you were younger um as you can probably tell, I probably responded better to feminine energy on screen, but of course there were men that I thought were attractive. Um, uh, but I distinctly remember, kind of like in my angst years, uh, mourning the fact that I would never look like Billy Crudup in Inventing the Abbots. Uh, this 1997 movie with Kathy Baker and Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, I, I remember very clearly seeing that in like seventh grade and being like, I want to look like, I can't look like that. Um, Lorenzo Lamas in Greece, I remember having that same reaction to. And um, there was a short period of time where I was fascinated with Vincent Perez and was renting a bunch of his films as an undergrad. As a young person, I think probably, well, Bruce Willis would be number one. Because of... Color of Night? No, no moonlighting. moonlighting. Oh my god, Moonlighting. Um, I forgot who else I had mentioned earlier. You? Bruce had... Willis. Um, Odd things come up. You, real world. Didn't you like people from that? Yeah, well, I was what? Like, well, I was like 18 or like Dan from Real World Miami. Um, 
Oh God, the uh, that TJ Friday show step by step. The cousin, I think the actor's name was Sasha. Sasha something. Yeah, lots of people. I mean, oh, Joey Lawrence from Blossom. Yeah, that was one. <laughs> uh, Zach from Saved by the Bell. Zach from Mark Paul. But also, I I tend to think many like a lot of people are attractive. Probably more than you. Like, like you. No, but I I think it's like. Again, real people, not sure. celebrities. And also, I find it... If someone finds me appealing, I find that very attractive. So, then, so that opens up a very broad yes. range of people. So, you know, I don't want those names I gave to presume that I have, like, a type or something. Oh, same. Like, and I... They're, yeah. Like, there are probably more recent people, too, I'm sure, but... Yeah. But, anyway, the last question, why are you both always so snarky and full of attitude? I don't know if this is shade, but... No was, Sade, huh? But yeah. I would say that, I just would say that we have personalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, don't. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not trying to be, like, mean or I don't, nasty. I, you know, at the same time, like, there are some things that deserve snark. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I do know that, it, yeah, I don't want to feel like a, a neutered personality, so... You know, can I just be me? Uh, <laughs> yes, you can. That's all can. I'm trying to be. Yes. Um, that's all of the questions I wrote, um, or had. So, I tried to consolidate because there was a little overlap. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate um, people's kind words. Of course, yeah. I hope that uh, once we're all uh, out of this pandemic that maybe we can interact with people more. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that'd be nice. Find new ways to connect. But uh, that's all I have. Same. All right. Bye. Bye.